you're going to find that you really are immersed in a process as you come here. And uh, as just an opening thing, I want to say you can react to it by um, uh, resisting that process. Um, or you can react to it by embracing and absorbing it. Now, uh, if you react by resisting it, you are going to have a bad experience and you are going to find a tremendous amount of energy that is expended in resisting, in saying, in saying no, that's not what I thought, <laughs> you know, etc. <coughs> if you absorb it, you'll have nine days at the end of those nine days, you'll go away. You'll have a lot of different ideas. It may be that then you go away and you think all those ideas are stupid. You can then get rid of them. But you will have submitted yourself to a very, I think, different kind of experience. Um, you know, be open. Um, wear relaxed pants. Um, you know, uh, enter into the process. And uh, at the worst, it'll be nine days and then you'll be able to go on with your own thing. But um, uh, be welcoming to it in your mind. I, I, in general, I, I, um, I want to talk about three main things. Uh, or rather, I, 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 I have what I want to say organized into three main session, sections. And um, the first is really concerned with w what is story? What is a story? Uh, um, I, you know, uh, you, you are all um, have uh, work behind you, or you've done scripts, or you've done movies, or you've done documentaries, etc. Um, so I don't want to be um, presumptuous, uh, and I want to be respectful in terms of the work that you that you brought here. That you know that that you carry inside you. But I also must tell you that one of the things that we've found in, in, in working here is that one of the really um, key uh, issues is um, the idea that what we're doing here, uh, the process that you're engaged in here, is really the process of making a story. And that, um, although that seems such a natural thing, uh, it, is, um, <coughs> it is quite a demanding process. Uh, and um, one which uh, uh, all of us uh, continue to find out things about as we do it. Uh, so I want to start on a what may seem like a simple level. Um, but I think I'll get back to it later on, just talking about what, what we mean when we say, what, what do we mean when we say, this is a story? What are we referring to? What makes a story? And then the second thing I want to talk about is um, the uh, approach um, to story making, um, both um, <coughs> in terms of uh, words that I think help define what that process is, and also words that I think uh, <coughs> open doors into uh, attitudes that you can have that help with the story-making process. And those words are the three that are written on the board there, dynamic, and organic, and iterative. And then at the end of that, and we'll take a break somewhere along the way, I want to talk a bit about uh, action and what action is, what we mean by action. Mm -hmm. 
So let me tell you a story. Um, when I was a young person, I come from a family of writers. And um, uh, um, in my family, if you weren't going to be a writer, you were out the door. When I began to write, and they were also a very ideological family, the intellectuals. So when I began to write, of course, I always thought about one thing, which was what did the story mean? You know, what was the meaning of the story? What was the story about? What was it about, etc.? What was the point of the story? And, um, and I would write, and I had some success or not success, etc. But there was one thing that always mystified me, which was that at one point in my life, a series of things had happened to me. And, um, and I used to tell this story about what had happened to me, this series of things. And um, of all the stories I told, this story always had the best reaction. People were always interested in it, and they always laughed. I'm going to tell it to you in a minute, probably now. You won't be interested. You won't laugh. But in the past, they always were interested. They always laughed. And, um, and, and the thing was, and they'd always say the same thing. They'd always say, oh, why don't you write that story? And the thing was that I never wrote the story because I never knew what it was about. I could never figure out what the meaning of the story was. So it was like a real conundrum to me. It was a real confusion to me. On the one hand, I, um, uh, I, you know, was, uh, I was a writer, I was interested in, oh, well, what does a story mean? What? On the other hand, this story that I had, which was the best thing I knew, because it was the only thing that people would ever always say, oh, you have to write that. I, I didn't know what it was about. And this was the story. Uh, years ago, I was a young man, and uh, I was very, very confident. Um, whether I was actually very insecure, and I acted like I was very confident, or whether I actually was very confident, it doesn't matter, I was very confident. And um, I was about 21 at the time, and a uh, piece of luck happened to me, which was I was very political back then, this was in the 60s, and I went to a university, Columbia University, and I uh, was very involved in politics there. And there was a big strike. I, maybe some of you know about it, maybe you don't. It was called the Columbia Strike. And it was a big, big event in America, in, in, America, in the United States at that time. It was a strike where everybody got involved, and that over a thousand of us were arrested, and we seized the university for, 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 for two and a half months, and um, the police were on campus, and we were fighting them, and it was a big, big, big deal. It was a kind of accident. I mean, I had been involved in politics, but the strike came along, and then, you know, because I was uh, articulate, whatever, um, I was one, I became one of the leaders. And um, uh, I, um, I was married at the time. As I became involved in the strike, we became alienated from each other, my young wife and I, Andrea. And, uh, and you know, um, we were on the front page of the newspapers every day. We were being quoted all the time. We were on the, you know, in the, in the, in television, etc. And uh, at one point, we went on a TV show where there was a guy who was interviewing us, and um, we, I was on the show with some other people. And uh, I was, you know, I was quite confident. And um, at one point, uh, he said to me, "You know, if I was the university." I'd take you, and I'd take you, and I'd take you, and I'd throw you out. And I had been a very, very good student, and I said to him, well, you know, I am an excellent student, and I've been Dean's List, which is like top honors, and the university had just given me a scholarship, and I said, and Columbia would be loath to throw me out. You know, would never throw me out. The next day I got home, there was a letter, it said, you're thrown out. <laughs> um, but I was undaunted. And about a couple of 
maybe a week after this show, I get a telephone call. We're all, we're, we're like communa, communards. You know, the, it, we're in a constant struggle situation. You know, we're living in buildings, we're all sleeping together, everything is blah, blah, blah. I get a call. And uh, it's, uh, the guy is on the phone and he says, my name is so-and-so, and he says, I'm a casting director. And uh, an Italian director who you may know named Michelangelo Antonioni is uh, coming to the United States to make a film. And uh, he is interested in your being the lead of this film because he's seen you on television. So I laugh and um, I laugh for two reasons. One, because this is the most absurd thing. Two, who would want to be in a movie now because I'm in the greatest movie of all with this strike and all the stuff that's going on. And three, I don't like Michelangelo Antonio. <laughs> Uh, is since La Ventura, I think his work has been decadent, and uh, I uh, think that, um, you know, Ponte Corvo, he's great, Michelangelo, he's not so good. So uh, I say, come on, I'm not interested. It's, come on, please come and meet with me. So I go to meet with him. And I had grown up in a kind of, as I say, they were intellectuals, but kind of working class family. And, um, uh, and New York and the world of money was unknown to me at that point. And he said, come to meet me in this tea, in a, a very famous restaurant downtown. And I came to meet him and he was this very smooth guy, you know, very suave. And, and we're in this restaurant, everything is gold, and it's air conditioned. And, I'm dressed in, we, we had a uniform back then, which was a dungarees, um, a t-shirt, um, uh, boots, army boots, and um, a fatigue jacket. And uh, I have no idea when we washed. And um, that was my uniform, I'm there then, and I'm in this place, and I don't even know what to order, you know? And, I've, I've, and, and he's this and that. And he says, you know, Michelangelo would really like to meet you. He wants you to be the lead of this movie he's doing. He's going to do a movie about the uh, radical movement in America. And um, he's seen you on television. And he wants everybody in the movie to be, you know, real, not actors. And uh, uh, I really would love you to meet with him. So I say, um, well, of course, you know, we were a political organization. I say, well, I have to go back to my work. I am not an individual. I am part of a collective. And I'll go back to my collective, and I'll come back, and I'll tell you what we have to say. <laughs> so I go to the collective, and we say, okay, well, this is what we'll do. We'll say, okay, if he gets $100,000, which was a huge amount of money at the time, and we can have... Uh, we can uh, get money for writing the script, and uh, he has to hire extras from us, and he has to give our organization, SDS, another $100,000, etc., etc. I'll do it. And there's one other thing. Um, uh, we decide, I have to have final, we have to have final cut. <laughs> so I go back and I meet this guy. And I say to him, well, look, these are what we want. If you want to do this, then it's fine. We, I'm, I'm interested. But uh, there's the money. And, uh, and he's going, oh, well, okay, this is the casting director. He's not Michelangelo. He's, he takes down everything, and he says, I'll relay this to Michelangelo. And I think, oh, my God. This is, and he keeps on calling. And I think, well, you know, when we said these things, I thought, oh, by the way, this was not negotiation. This was a demand. It was like either do this or nothing. And, um, uh, and I thought it would never proceed. And, um, but he keeps on calling. And Michelangelo is very interested. He's coming to New York at such a point, etc. Fine. So uh, he says, um, there's one thing. I said, what's that? He said, there's no problem with anything. You can have all of your, your, all of your, everything you want, 
there's, there's one problem. Um, uh, there's no final cut. I said, there's no final cut, then we don't do it, that's all. So he said, well, I'll talk to Michelangelo about it. And I thought, fine, because I didn't want to be in the movie. And uh, my, um, my wife was up then in Vermont, which is a, she was in the country, and uh, I had to go see her. And I went to see her, and it was on a weekend, and it was hot like it is now but there was no breeze, it was in the middle of the country. And um, I don't know why, but you know, she had this dog, which I had loved, it was a big poodle. And he was, he, you know, he was a large poodle and very handsome and quite proud. And because it was so hot, she had shaved him, so he was now like a naked poodle. <laughs> and uh, every, sadness I felt at what was going on between the two of us, which I didn't really understand, um, was somehow embodied in this very sad, hot, um, <coughs> naked dog. And I only wanted to get out of there. I mean, we were having these horrible discussions that you have when you're breaking up and you're 21 or 22 and you don't know what you want to do. And I just wanted to get out of this fucking country and get back to Colombia where my life was and where we were making history and things were great. And in the midst of some horrible conversation, the phone rings, and it's the casting director. And he says, uh, Michelangelo is in New York, he wants to see you right away. And I say, I'm in Vermont. I'm, you know, this is 1968. It's not like, I'm, you know, hours away. No problem. We'll have a plane come and get you. <laughs> so I think he's kidding. But actually, I go drive to the airport, and there is a little plane. And I go in. I've never been in a plane before in my life. And I get flown, and I call up my, mini, my, my colleagues, and I say, I'm, we're meeting with Michelangelo tonight. Tonight is the night. And they meet me, and we're all there in our uniform. <laughs> and Michelangelo is staying at the Carlisle Hotel, which was the classy hotel in New York at the time. It's where uh, President Kennedy used to go to have his affairs. <coughs> And um, the idea of me going into the Carlisle Hotel was quite incredible. It was like a fairy tale. And I walk into the hotel, and uh, we go up into the room, and there's this huge <coughs> suit, and there's Michelangelo, who was an immensely dignified and um, 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 you know graceful individual with superb manners and uh, much, you know, much charm. And um, I am so grateful that you have come. And, you know, and he's calling us comrade. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and shaking our hands. And, and there are all these beautiful young women around. You know, uh, they all seem to be English for some reason. And they're walking around, and they're costume directors, and they're this, and they're that. And they're all smoking joints. And, um, and then there's some other guys, you know, and there's the casting director. And Michelangelo says, why don't we go downstairs to the restaurant and we'll have something to eat and we can talk about my film. Oh, I say, fine. There were three of us. And, um, and you have to understand, at that point, I mean, we had negotiated with everybody. We had had, you know, the, the, the university administration, the mayor of New York, the police, etc. There was we were very fearless, you know. We just didn't care, and um, we had all got, gotten arrested and we had gotten beaten up, and we just, you know, we we knew what we wanted, and um, we go downstairs to the to the to the restaurant, and then we walk in, and the guy at the restaurant looks at us, and he says, um, "I'm sorry, we can't serve you." because none of you are wearing dinner jackets. And we only have, you know how in the restaurant, they always have an extra dinner jacket, but they only had one and there were three of us. 
So we said, okay, we'll go back up to the room, we'll order, you know, order in. And this was a tremendous problem for me because I could not for the life of me figure out what I should order. And I thought, you know, I'm never going to have this chance again in my life of ordering food at the Carlisle Hotel and I have no idea what to order because I didn't have the menu. So like a schmuck, I ordered a hamburger. <laughs> and then up comes this hamburger in this enormous silver tray with a great dome on it. And the man said, your hamburgers? <laughs> Here's the hamburger and we start to eat. And we start talking to Michelangelo. And it's maybe eight o'clock at night. And uh, we say, well, these are our demands. And no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. Final cut, I can't give you final cut. We say, well, then there's nothing to talk about. Well, let's talk about the film. Let me talk to you about why I can't give you final cut. And so he starts, you know, this cinematic genius, and he's talking to the three of us schmucks uh, and uh, treating us very respectfully, then going on about, and, and now he's trying to, I mean, I have to tell you that in telling the story, I get a little embarrassed because he was selling himself to us, you know? And he was saying, you have to understand, during the war, I was with the resistance, I was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, I am doing the same thing in my work that Ponte Corvo is doing in his work, but it's from a different point of view. And he's trying to convince us that he is a true revolutionary just like us. You know, and that he should be even so concerned to convince us, it seemed. And of course, what are we doing? We're fighting with him. You're not really a revolutionary. Uh, your work is very decadent. Uh, you have no interest in the working class. Uh, you, there is no Maoist perspective in your work. And he's saying, no, there is a Maoist perspective. On and on and on. And we keep on coming back to this issue of final cut. And the hours pass. And there's more and more dope smoking in the room. And the women become more beautiful. And everybody is coming in on the discussion. And Michelangelo is talking more and more to us. And I am beginning to think, I can't believe it. He's going to go along with Final Cut. He's going to give us this thing. And we keep on arguing, stronger and stronger for it. And we have to have Final Cut. <laughs> and finally, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, and we say, for the last time, all three of us, at great length, because we were very expert by this time in dialectics. Exactly why the only way he could make his movie would be if he gave us Final Cut. And we finish and I think, he's going to give us Final Cut. And he looks and he stands up and he says, I am an artist. Unique, no final cut. And he walks out of the room, and that was the end of my acting career. <laughs> now, why is that a story? I'm asking, why is that a story? What makes it a story? What are the, what, 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 uh, Elements combined. What elements does it have that make it a story? Conflict. It has conflict. What is the conflict? To complete the wills. Which were? The communist collective <laughs> Okay, so there's conflict. Anything else? What else makes it a story? Beginning is a woman. The beginning is what? The beginning is uh, your point where you where you where you were at before the call. Before the yes when you shoot the first call and it passed uh, before I get the first call, yeah. yeah. So there's a beginning and middle end at least in the sense of, you know, getting the call, the development of the story and then the end of and the end and, and the end of that. 
Is that the only beginning, middle, and end in the story? Well, let's get back to that. What else does it have that makes it a story? What else? The characters, the characters. Um, okay, so there's, there's me, there's the casting director. Uh, I, you know, could I have elaborated? Could there have been more characters? There could have been the other people who I was with. I mean, there's even a kind of historical interest because two of them actually were quite important then in the history of the left in America, the new left. Um, um, there's Michelangelo. Uh, if I wanted to, I could, there's my wife, who I didn't, unfortunately, um, elaborate as a character, but I could have elaborated her as a character. There's the dog. Um, uh, there's, um, there could have been more in terms of the people in the, uh, in the hotel. Um, uh, um, there's a protagonist, correct? But the protagonist is the protagonist is me. Is there an antagonist? It's clear to me, or maybe it's not clear in the telling of the story, that the world in some way, the world outside, is a kind of antagonist in the story. You know, that this world of planes, of, of hotels, of money, of, 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 of television, of the world itself is a kind of... Um, is something which the, uh, the protagonist feels um, alienated from and feels uh, in some way really opposed to. Um, and it is, uh, if you were to call this story, you know, um, what kind of genre would this story be, would you call it? Well, it's a coming of age story. But what does the, what does the story mean? I mean, is there a meaning? So I found the story extremely boring, actually, because with two opponents, not to, not giving up space to the other, so there's no development to, to my eyes. And what was interesting was, for example, for example, the image of the dog that was about a totally different country, that is the one with your, with your wife. So you say it was boring. Yeah. Okay. But at the same time, you say you were waiting for it to change, as though there was, it was like a mistake that I add this one thing and not another, etc. But is it possible that, in fact, I was having those things together um, for some reason? Yes, yes, of course. And that part of the reason was to. Um, give a greater depth to the character than it would have been if I had simply been telling the story of, uh, if I had been telling it as a joke, where it would have just led to the thing with Antonioni. Um, but let me, well, let me ask you in a different way. You got annoyed at the, at the protagonist. Yeah. How many people got annoyed at the protagonist? You got annoyed at the Did you have his feeling? And, a little bit different way because I thought that um, the ending was disappointing and when you said in terms of as a coming of age there was something in terms of okay the arrogance of, of youth and you know confidence that you're so confident you missed the bigger goal. So you were annoyed? Yeah. Was there anybody who liked the, the protagonist? You liked the protagonist. You, you liked the protagonist. You, you liked it. Yeah. I'm surprised. Why? <laughs> <laughs> it seems interesting. Why did it seem interesting to you? Because of uh, the dog. The <laughs> it's clear in the telling of it that there is a point of view that I that in which it is that I've shaped these events and everything like that, right? My point is this: that the story, to the extent that it is, it's a uh, it's a good story. Um, doesn't yield one meaning. I could shape that story so that it has a very specific meaning. I could shape that story to mean I was young and confident and stupid and blah, 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 blah. I could shape that story to mean I had a chance at becoming a movie star and I didn't make it. I could shape that story to mean um, uh, this is a real coming of age story and I learned at that moment 
oh my God, what it is to be an artist and to have real integrity, and I didn't have it, et cetera, et cetera. I could shape that story to mean a lot of different things. Now, it's very interesting, because simply the story happened to me. I never tried to shape it. I would simply tell people the story, and they were interested in it. And as they were interested in it, I realized that exactly what I thought was the most important thing about being a writer, which was to shape your material so that it yielded a point, was exactly what was not necessary. And that this story, which whether you, you know, I hope I didn't bore you too much, but um, which has a certain kind of life to it, worked because it did not yield a specific point. That people got involved in it. That they had very different reactions to it. That they were free to make up their own minds about it. That some people like the character who I presented, and some people don't like the character who I presented, and some people think, oh, it should have more about the wife, and the other people think it should have more about something else, and other people are more interested in uh, whether or not it was Zabriskie Point, and what actually happened with Zabriskie Point. And because the story allows me to capture, for 20 minutes or so, people's attention, and it creates this world in which for a little bit you live, and which provokes a whole spectrum of response. Now, there are things that go into the making of that story. That is to say, I've told that story, I don't know, over a hundred times in my lifetime, probably. And, um, and in the process of it, I've refined it. We're going to talk about that in a little bit and talk about iteration. Usually there's always something new that comes up. I never describe the dog the way I described him today. Um, I always do the thing with the hamburger. Um, I always have the last joke. Uh, I always um, I always talk about the plane. Um, you know, etc. But the thing is that the difference between that story and any of the stories I made up up until that point is that it's a natural thing. Because it happened to me, I never had to invent. These were the things that actually happened. And so I could tell them <coughs> they had a natural shape to them. They had a natural flow to them. And they yielded, naturally, interest and attention from an audience. Now what you were trying to do is to create here a story that you're going to tell as a screenplay, but a story that has as much naturalness as that story was, which has naturalness because it happened to me. And that is a very, I can be a very difficult thing to do. Because something happens, you never question its believability. The story has a, a natural, what I call a natural life to it. It has a single energy. Um, and it then has these component parts which are its elements. And I think if you were to look at what is the way of thinking about your progress here, it's going to be this. You are coming in, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, with probably a mechanism. You have maybe some character, maybe some circumstance, you have maybe some plot points, and it's a mechanism. But what you don't have yet, probably, is a story in the way that that was a story. And what you are going to want to try to do is to turn your mechanism into a story.
So the three questions are one, what is it about? Well, what, where, what the fuck is my story about? You know, because the whole thing about a story on some level is your question of selection. You're picking, what writing is, is picking. That's your work. You're endlessly picking, you're endlessly selecting. You're selecting characters, you're selecting incidents. You're selecting the words that you use to describe those things. That's why, you know, if you work hard at the typewriter for four or five hours, on the one hand, you haven't done anything physically exhausting. On the other hand, you need to go to sleep because you have been picking things. And that is, but the only way you can pick things is if you have some standard to know what it is that works and what it is that doesn't work. So one of the things that you have is, what is it about? What is the story about? Another question is, what happens next? Of all of these questions, this is the most important question. For a very simple reason. Because if you don't have what happens next, then you don't have anything to write. If you don't have anything to write, you feel miserable. You sit in front of the typewriter, the page is blank, you don't know what to do, you're a bum, and that's it. So you need to know what happens next. So those are the first two. And the third question is, does it suck? You know, is it any good? Which is the other question that you're always asking yourself in some way. Now these three questions define in some way what the work is about. If you know at the end of some point, you know what your story is about, you know all the things that have happened in it, and you know it's okay, you've finished your story. You've finished your work. You've done good work. That's it. You go on to the next thing. If you don't, then you still have more work to do. And the relationship of these three questions to each other is a dynamic relationship. That is, each of these questions informs or interweaves or is integrated with or intertwined with the other. You cannot know what your story is about without knowing what happens next. You cannot know whether your story sucks or is good or not unless you know what it's about. You cannot know what it's about in some way if you don't know whether or not it has any valuable qualities. So you cannot approach a story from the point of view of what it is that you, that you are going to answer one of these questions, and then the next question, and then the third question. But you have to be open to all of these questions existing in you and being answered at the same time. And I actually think of this process as a storm. Um, you know how a storm, like a hurricane, you know, the nature of it is that, you know, there's, I don't know, whatever, there's like hot air, and then there's the warm water, and the hot air gets over the warm water, and the warm water goes up into the hot air, and then it makes the hot air even hotter, so that makes the water warmer, so then the waves get bigger, and then they crash, and then there's more rain, and then it keeps on and it feeds on itself, right? And it feeds on itself. And, uh, you know, when you're really working and making a story, you're in a storm. You should be in a storm in which these different elements are coming together. And, you know, you're thinking to yourself what it's about. Okay, this is a story. This is a story about... Uh, uh, this is a story about... Uh, about, um, 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 this is a story about, it's a coming of age story. Well, fantastic, and then what happens next? And then, well, what happens next is that he breaks up with his wife, so, no, it's not a coming of age story, it's a, 
It's a, it's a, it's a tragic old romance. And then, but then, yeah, I like that it's a tragic old romance. But then what it's, and then, and then what happens next? He meets another woman. And then he meets another, and then, what's, no, it's not a tragic old romance. It's really, it's a love story. Ah, it's a love story. And what happens in the love story? He comes of age. You go back, you see, you go back. But you're always going deeper, deeper into the story. And what you always are trying to find is what is the dramatic material. By dramatic material, I mean two things. One thing is very specifically, practically. Now, it's something I want to say, which is, I, you know, <clears throat> There are a lot of different approaches to how it is that you, um, everybody wants to be a, you know, screenwriting is now the way we tell stories. So everybody wants to be a screenwriter, blah, blah, blah. There are a lot of different approaches to how you teach that. Um, uh, and um, I meet all the time with students who want to be told, you know, this is the way you do it and you have this plot point, do you have that thing, etc. Uh, and um, I like to think that there are three ways to approach a problem. There are three kinds of things that you can do. One thing is you can come up with a mechanical solution. You come in with a story and we say, you know what? You don't have an inciting incident on page 15 and your climax on, uh, for the first act is on page 40 and it should be on page 35, uh, blah, 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 blah. And it's a mechanical solution. That's one way of doing something. Another way, which I actually learned a lot through Nick Proferis, is a different way. I call it the um, um, invasive way. The first time I ever saw him do this was in here in Greece nine, ten years ago. There was this woman. She had this very complicated Greek story. It's all, you know, and this boy and this other guy and, uh, and, uh, and it's internet and terribly complicated psychology, etc. And she's going on and going on and he goes... It needs a gun. <laughs> she grabs, he grabs his bag and he has it, she finds a gun. He'll just come up with something just to fucking speed the goddamn thing along. Just to throw something into it. Just to shake it up, you know? And that can have a tremendous effect. And he does it because he has tremendous instinct as a storyteller. You know, he just has an instinctual feel. What is dramatic? You know, let me shake this thing up. Let me get it going, you know? So that's another kind of thing. Now, I don't have either of those two talents. I, and I say that, uh, and I mean that seriously. So what I try to do is I try to sink myself into I, I, many years ago, I read a, a, a newspaper account of um, a, a brilliant woman. She won the Nobel Prize. She was a biologist. And she won the, the prize for um, um, underst understanding, coming up with this, a discovery about the way a cell works. I don't remember what exactly it was, but it had to do with protein receptors or something like that. You know, but on a very, 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 very tiny level of understanding the human organism. And they said to her, they said, you know, how did you come up with this? How did you come up with this thing? And she said, I sat and I thought, I am a cell. How do I act as a cell? And she imagined herself into being a cell. And she came up with this answer. And that has lived with me ever since. So I think of your story like it's a cell. And I think, what is going on in this story? 
What is happening here? How can this story develop so that it really becomes what it is supposed to be? You know? So those are three different kinds of ways of going at it. Now what's interesting is that it is probably true that you very well may get the same answer in any, you know, using all three different kinds of things. That is a good, a good inventive, imaginative, sympathetic critiquer of your story, listener to your story, will probably end up coming up, leading you to the same place. Because stories have their own logic. But that's the way I approach things. So I try to think about what is it that's in the story? What gives the story life? There's no book which has remained as central in the understanding of a discipline as the poetics is. I mean, you know, if you think of, you know, whether it's religion, whether it's law, whether it's ethics, etc., there are all kinds of things that come. But in drama, in, 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 in dramaturgy, uh, uh, everything always goes back to the poetics, which is a kind of amazing thing, because, you know, it's not even him, it's just notes that some people took of him. Um, but I think that the thing that is really at the core of it is the idea that because he was a biologist, he thought about always what is the essential nature of the thing I am studying. And so for him, the idea of drama was such a thing. And he was like, what is the essential nature of drama itself. And the idea that a drama or that a story or that a tragedy, or whatever you want to call it, but that a narrative, a piece of storytelling that has a praxis, that is about the doing of something, has a nature, is a very powerful idea. And if you have that nature, then you can go forward. You're going to find that there are people who have stories, they live with these stories for a long time. It was always amazing to me. There are people, they work on stories three, four, five, six years. They do 11 drafts of them. You ever stop to think, why? How can they do that? How, how does this thing have so much energy that they can keep on coming back to it? Because a story, if it's a real story, has a life. It's like an atom or it's like a cell. It's like an atom in that it has energy. And if you go to the core of it and explode it, you're going to get a lot of energy. And it's like a cell because it has a natural life. It grows. And if you can find that, then you can make the story come to life. So you got these three questions. And their relationship to each other, as I say, is a dynamic relationship. It's a storm. You want it to be a storm. You do not want to be sitting in your room at 2 o'clock in the morning saying to yourself, oh, I figured out what it is about. And then you want to be in your room at 2 o'clock in the morning thinking, God, fucking damn it. I had this thing, and I thought I knew what it was about, and now I've come up with this great new character, but now it means I don't know what it's about, and that it pushes you to understand the story on a deeper level. There are three basic forms, there are three basic elements. There's your structural questions. And the structural questions always have to do basically with what is your beginning and your middle and your end? Well, what are your, what are your three acts, right? What is your beginning and your middle and your end? You're always changing that. You're never going to be able to write further once you have, until you have your first act. This is like an example of what I mean with a dynamic relationship. You can never write really that far until you have a solid first act. But the problem is that as you write past your first act, you find out more about what your story has and so you always have to be constantly changing your first act. So you're going back and forth, right? 
So the question of what, is the stru what are the structural questions, what is the issue of what the beginning is, what the middle is, what the end is, what your acts are, where they begin, where they end, that is always one question. One thing to keep in mind about that is that you can think of your characters in terms of having three aspects to their lives, which is they have a work aspect, they have a love aspect or a spiritual aspect, and they have a communal aspect. That is, all of us, we, have, we work, we have some relationship to some kind of spiritual life, and we have a communal life within a community. When your main character has gone through a change in his or her relationship to each of those three things, your act is over. So, very simply, in something like The Bicycle Thief, the beginning of the first act, the man has no job, he's alone, and um, he feels like he's not providing for his family. At the end of the first act, he has a job, he is delighted by, he's beloved by his son, and uh, he's off working with a group of, uh, with a, you know, with, with a group of people. At the beginning of the second act, the bike is stolen, etc., etc. So we go from there. So one thing is you can worry about what your, in terms of what are your structural questions. Um, another thing that you can think about also is what is the content of the act itself? What are the sequences that make up the act? A very easy thing to do to think about is to think about everything in terms of threes. So you have the beginning and middle and end, that's a three. Within your beginning, you have the beginning of the beginning, you have the middle of the beginning, you have the end of the beginning. Same thing with the second act, same thing with the third act. So if you're asking yourself, where is your character in relationship to all these things, you begin to get markers and you begin to get some sense of what it is that the structure of your piece is. You then have questions of content. Questions of content are largely in terms of, one, the characters, and two, the circumstances. Who is your main character? Who is your protagonist? What makes your protagonist, you know, how do you define him or her? And similarly, questions of content are about what the circumstances are. One of the ways of thinking about a story is that you are always having a character change in relationship to circumstance. When your character stops changing in relationship to circumstance, your story stops dead and we lose interest. It's exactly what you were saying about, for example, my story, where you felt like the character wasn't changing in relationship to the circumstance, so you felt it was boring. So, if it's true for me, think about it being true for yourself. If the character stops being in changing in relationship to the circumstance, we lose our interest. You may think, it's a very powerful moment that we now have a close-up of this man and he doesn't know what to do. It is not interesting. It is boring. Because what we want to see is people in action, which we'll get into in a second. So you have those questions of the, of the, of the character and of the circumstances. And by circumstances, what I mean is not simply um, not simply uh, a predicament that the character finds himself in, but the circumstances of his or her life. 
um, what the dramatic circumstances. And finally, we have the issues of theme. And by theme, <coughs> I do not mean a thesis. There is a relationship between an idea that you have and the story that you come up with. Many of you and most of us start, perhaps, with an idea in our head. We want to make a story about um, passion, okay, or something like that. And we have an idea in our head, and that leads to a story. But the thing is that we do not want to limit our inventiveness to a specific thesis, a specific idea. The more you are going to insist that the story is about a specific idea, the more you are going to cut off whatever creative possibilities exist in the story. So what you really want to do is think about the story in terms of what I call an emotional field, F-I-E-L-D. So, you know, you think about, like for example, you have all of you seen The Seven Samurai? Well, that entire film, in a way, is about standing up. That's what happens in the course of the film. And you could think about the film if you were talking to Kurosawa, and you'd say, well, what is, the, what is the theme of your film? I mean, I don't know that he would say this. What is the thing that you use to decide what should be in the film and what should not be in the film? He, would, he might say to you, that film is about standing up. That's what it's about. That's what I use to pick. That's what I call an emotional field. It's not, a, it's not an idea. It's a, it's a, it's a aspect or a, um, a, um, a part of human experience. And so then you can use that to understand what your story is about. Your story is about betrayal. Your story is about pain. Your story is about people being out of place. Your story is about any number of these different things. You're not telling the audience what to think about this thing. You are merely depicting the thing itself. You are merely depicting the thing itself. And these three things can work together so that as you ask your structural questions, where does my story begin? That should tell you something about what the thematic content of the story is. And as you find out what your thematic content is, that should give you a clue about what the circumstances should be and what the characters can be, etc. In answering those questions, etc., there should be some sense of what makes the story more whole. That is, you know, what works in the story and what doesn't work in the story. If you say, if we're talking about a story, and you say to me, oh no, I want the character to say so and so and so and so, because it's very important to me to express this point of view, etc., etc., that has nothing to do with the story. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with what you think it should be, it has to do with what you want us to think, blah, 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 blah. It has nothing to do with the life of the story. Where do you find the life of the story? I have a theory, which is that stories present themselves to us first as an image. Um, uh, and um, it, can be any, it can be of any different kind of image. It can be an image that stays in your mind of something that you've seen. It can be, um, it can be uh, a, 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 like a diagram. It can be um, a piece of music. Um, you know um, uh, Chinatown? The whole idea of Chinatown came to Robert Town, the writer, 
when one day he got out of his house, he lived in, he'd grown up in, 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 um, in um, Los Angeles his whole life. And he was used to smelling orange blossoms because there were, used to be a lot of orange groves in Los Angeles in that area. And he got out of his house one day and he started walking down the street. And he could no longer, he realized he no longer smelled the oranges. And that was the beginning of Chinatown. And he went back to that image always in the telling of the story. It always, it, 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 it meant to him that this was the thing that said to him what the story was about. Now, he did not understand what that image meant altogether at that time. He didn't understand that it meant the corruption of Los Angeles, the growing of it into this big city, the betrayal of it, blah, 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 blah. But it was the one thing which always made sense to him about the story. Um, in a way, uh, it's like a kind of faith. It's the faith that you have in the story. It is the one thing that you possess which is unprovable and is unshakable. You know that that idea has got to be in the story and you don't know what it is about. If you do not have that, you do not have a story. So if you don't have it, you better find it. Where did your story come from? What is the image that provided? And I'll tell you why that it has to be an image. Because a real story, because our mind thinks in terms of images. And I'll give you an example from the story I told. The dog. The dog is such an image. I've lived with that dog for years. If you ever ask me about that thing, it's what I always think about. There are other things I think about in terms of that story, but the dog is always something. Now why? Because to me, the dog combines so many different ideas and so many different feelings and so many different associations in that one image. And so if I were to tell a story about, just say, that weekend with my ex-wife, I would always say what I need, what this story is about, is the about, it is about the feeling that I had when I looked at that dog. Because that is the thing that is absolutely true to me about that moment. And I could always go back to that. And then if somebody said, well, why don't you do blah, 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 blah. No. Why? Because it's not about the dog. Now, the dog is like, as I say, it's like an atom. It combines a tremendous amount of associations. All of those associations are in the image. You do not know what all those associations are yet. So you have to understand what those associations are. You have to explode the atom of the image in a way. You have, to, you have to go into it and figure out what is this image that is saying? What is it saying to me? But you all should have some sense of what that thing is. And the way that in the relationship between what is dynamic and what is organic is that the more you ask the questions of structure and of content and of theme, the closer and closer you get to understanding what is the energy inside the story. What is the energy inside that image? Because your story needs energy. That's what it has to have. When you think about structural things, one of the things is the beginning and the middle and the end. The other thing that you always need to be thinking about is what is the plot by which I mean to say what is the cause and effect relationship of events in the story? Do they make sense or do they not make sense? Are they pushing forward or are they not pushing forward? So that you have those two things always to think about. Now finally, these two things, the dynamic and the organic, 
lead to the third thing, which is the iterative. Now, iterative means to tell and tell over and over and over again. And, you know, if you think of stories, stories are a verbal form. Um, every kind of thing that we, every kind of narrative that exists, first exists as a spoken narrative. And one of the things that you can do to get to your dramatic material, to find out what is essential in terms of your scenes, what, what is the central point of your scenes, etc., is to tell your story. This is an enormous risk because you can write a complete piece of worship but it's very difficult to tell another person a complete piece of worship. So if I'm telling you the story, and I've written it, and I go, oh, and in the second act this happens, and that happens, etc., etc., and it has absolutely no conviction for me, I can do that. But if I am talking, talking to, to you, and I'm telling you about what happens, and we get to the second act, and I see Giovanni falling asleep as he is at this moment right now, <laughs> then I know, oh my God, something is really wrong here. Something is really, up, I'm not, and also I feel it inside myself. When I'm talking and I'm telling a story and I know it's flowing and it's natural, I feel perfectly confident. As soon as I get to a part where I feel I'm making something up, I suddenly feel like I'm walking on thin ice. I start to stutter. I go, I, you know what I do? I always go, you know what I mean? <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then, you know, he falls in love with her. You know what I mean? Because I don't know what I mean. <laughs> I have no idea. And the more you tell the story, the more you can find out what are the parts where you really know what the story is and the parts that you really don't know where the story is. So one of the things that you want to be doing, whether it's in your group or whether it's among friends that you make here, etc., is using the time to tell the story over and over and over again and using their responses and, more importantly, the response inside yourself to figure out what is true and what is not true for the story. The key to all this is to think in terms of action, which is what we began with when I said to you, I realized at some point I didn't know what action was. Um, you know, action is, drama is the telling of stories through action. And what that means is, it's the telling of story through doing things. Now let me make an analogy. There's a statue I know in a cathedral in Nuremberg. Do any of you know St. Sebald in Nuremberg? It's a very beautiful cathedral. And there's a man who made statues there named Weitschbusch in about the 1500s. And he was an incredible carver. And he has a crucifixion of Christ. And um, it's just Christ's arm, the hand, the nail going through into the cross. Do you know him? You don't know him? He's a great, great sculptor. And um, it's made of wood. And you know, you see the veins, you see the muscles, um, you see the tension of the hand you know, from the pain of the nail going through it. You see the flesh being drawn by the iron, piercing it.
and you look at it, and you know, if I said to you, what do you see? What you'd say is, I see wood, I see lines, uh, I see the, um, the effect of the chisel in the wood, etc. And then if I said to you, what else do you see? You would say, I see wood being presented like it's a piece of flesh. Uh, maybe I see pain. And if I would ask you on another level, what is it that you see? You might actually end up coming up and saying you see an idea, which I see in the piece, which is why I love it, which is that the sculptor has turned this piece of wood into a living piece of flesh in the same way, in a way, that presumably Christ turns his body into uh, something that provides us with, uh, if we're Christian, with salvation. But that idea is not what you see at first. That's an idea that you get very late on. What you see is the actual material. In writing, drama, the equivalent of the wood, the chisel, the line, the shadow, volume, is what people do. Do not worry about your ideas. Worry about what your characters do. That is the element of composition that you need to focus on. Your ideas will arise out of that. They are not to be carried by that. Just let what they do, just let them do what it is that they want to do. Now, when you think of action, there are many different levels to it. There is the level of a simple act, a gesture. Somebody lights a cigarette. That's an act. Think of action as a change in the character's relationship to circumstance. I'm talking to you now. I get a drink of water. That's a change. Okay? It's a very simple change, but it's an act. Before, it didn't happen. Now, it's happened. On the next level, if you put together a series of acts that are, that follow one another, that's the next level. So, I smoke a cigarette. That's a series of acts. I light the cigarette. I smoke the cigarette. I put away the cigarette. If you're a dramatist, the more you break down what the action is, the more material you have. One of the things is that you think you don't have enough material. If you have any kind of real story, you probably have too much material. But you're not dramatizing the material that you have. You're not breaking it down enough in terms of what its different, distinct parts of action are. Now, if you take a series of events, and you put them together, you have another level of action. So, <coughs> going out on a date. You prepare for the date. You go out on the date. You have a um, um, post, uh, um, you know, a, uh, uh, a post, a conversation with your friend after the date as to whether or not it's good. That's a sequence. You can, if you think of your character doing that, that means that there's been a change in his or her circumstance from before to after. Then finally, there is the action of a whole series of sequences. So for example, in um, The Seven Samurai. The first act is, first sequence, what are they going to do about the robbers? 
Second sequence, going to the town to end up uh, to um, hire some samurai. Third sequence, hiring the samurai and bringing them back to the village. Now this is a big chunk of film that we're talking about. This is probably about 45 minutes, that first act. But you can chart exactly what is happening in terms of those three actions that is going on. And at every moment, the characters are changing in relationship to their circumstance. In the first minute of the film, they're gonna be attacked by the, by, the, by, by, the, by the bandits. They have no way to defend themselves. In minute 20, they have decided, okay, we're gonna to go to town, we're gonna to hire, hire some samurai. In minute 40, they've hired the samurai and they're coming back to, there's a change in their circumstance. You can always chart that. The other thing to remember is that with action, you have external action and you also have internal action. That is, the character decides things. You know, that's why you have your close-ups. You know, but you have to be aware of when your character is having an internal action, what that action is. What is it that they are deciding? How are they deciding it? I'll give you an example. There is a Kishlovsky, one of the, um, I think it's the first or the second of the Decalogues. And um, a character is very, very sick and he's in the hospital. Do you remember? Or is it the, first. It's the first one. He's lost his son. His son has died in the uh, skating accident in the, in the lake. And he's very, very sick. And he is in despair. And he lies in the bed. And then there's this amazing shot. I don't know how he did it. Which is he has a glass with a little straw in it next to the bed. Do you know the shot? And a fly comes. And he's drinking soda, I guess so that there's some stickiness onto the straw. And the fly goes down too low, and he gets the sugar on his feet. And then the shot is just of the guy looking at the fly as the fly struggles to get up from the soda, up the straw, and finally fly away. And in the process of him looking at the fly and the fly doing that, the man decides he's going to live. And then he gets up and he starts becoming well. So it's an internal action. He's deciding, but it's dramatized by the struggle of the fly. So you always have to be aware of that so that you can be able to say, this is what is going on inside the character at that particular moment. I hope that uh, what I've said is of some help to you. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening, and um, have a good evening.